Hello and welcome to this video and this video is going to be called John Bonham the greatest rock drummer question mark so I really want to explore the idea that John Bonham is the greatest rock drummer of all time um, now I was going to do a video where I ranked my 10 favorite moments by John Bonham but actually as I start to think through the video and how to structure it in my mind I realise I've been missing out a lot of personal information that could make the video much more interesting. So um, the personal information that I can give is actually from my time not only playing with Robert Plant but also being friends with a number of other musicians that either knew John Bonham or played with him. Um, those stories and that influence has actually very much coloured my opinion of John Bonham over the years and so I thought I'd like to share some of that knowledge in this video. Now what made me um, decide to do this video is I was watching another video where there was an expert talking about John Bonham and they were trying to work out who his influences were and what was interesting was because John's no longer with us it's very difficult to go back and ask him. So you're going on the interviews he did at the time and maybe stuff he told other musicians. And of course, John Bonham's interviews are few and far between. So here we have a musician that's really had such an influence on rock drumming and rock music. And yet we, there's a mystery there as to you know who he was, what was he into, you know who did he listen to, how did he learn, and basically, what was it that made him change the face of drumming? I find that quite interesting. I find that quite mysterious. Okay? So, um, my personal connection to, to John Bonham is the fact that for a, a few years, around about 20 years ago, um, for two or three years, I was uh, Robert Plant's drummer. Um, when you drum for Robert Plant, obviously, you can't help but feel that you are stepping into... <laughs> this incredible drum chair, you know, which of course you're not, but obviously the comparisons happen straight away. Now, um, I grew up a huge fan of rock music and my favorite band was Led Zeppelin. Um, my favorite rock, rock drummer was John Bonham. And if I had to say who the greatest rock drummer was, I would probably say it's John Bonham. Um, so I come at this from a very, um, you know, from a position where I absolutely love his drumming. But then, compounded by the fact that after being a little 12, 13, 14 year old kid absolutely worshipping John Bonham, that years later I, I, I got the gig with uh, Robert Plant. Now, when I was playing with Robert, um, I can remember I had a, a Yamaha stage custom kit at the time, which was very fusion sounding, very snappy and bright. And I felt for the music we were playing, I needed some much more sort of vintagey type kit. So I said this to Robert and he said, oh, I've got, a, I've got an old Ludwig kit you can borrow. And so, um, you know, he dug out this old Ludwig kit. And I, was, I went and played on that, tuned it up, um, you know, took it to the gigs, you know. Um, and because I was, Traveling, taking it around the back of my car, I remember thinking, well, this is a this is a late 60s Ludwig kit. It's got to be worth something. I, I can't just be dumped in the back of my car, so I better get some cases for it. So I went back to Robert and said, have you got any cases for it? And he went, yeah, sure. And we went and sort of dug through his garage and he pulled out a number of cases. On those, those cases was written, John Bonham Led Zeppelin. Now, this is... <laughs> This is the sort of legend that we are approaching. The, the, when I saw this, I was sort of, oh my God, these are John Bonham's drum cases. Um, and I said to Robert, I said, these are John Bonham's drum cases. And he went, well, it's John Bonham's kit. I realized then I'd been playing John Bonham's kit. <laughs> this, that, I think, anyone who's listened to that, any drummers out there will, will probably go, oh my God, you know. That must have been spooky. That must have been uh, a hair-raising moment. And it sure was. So this illustrates the legendary status that John Bonham has. This is, is from the incredible music he made. And his incredible stamp as a drummer on that music. 
you know so there's some fantastic ba bands out there but uh, often the drummer doesn't make such an important stamp on the music but if you think of a band like the police you know you can't approach the police without really contending with Stuart Copeland's incredible input into that band and so Stuart Copeland becomes a really important feature of that band if you want to critique it and I think Led Zeppelin the same the same thing you know this incredible music is sat upon this incredible foundation and then I think the second factor is the fact that because John Bonham then died, you know, pretty young, that gives that music a rarity. We can't grasp it anymore. You know, we can't sit John Bonham down and say, how did you come up with the crunge? You know, we can't do this. So that becomes um, a sort of legendary thing. I mean, that, that term is, is bandied around a lot, you know, legend. But I think in rock music, you know, Bonham has become a legend because he's he died so young. All right. And so um, going back to my time with Robert, and I think this story illustrates more why he was great rather than just illustrating how great he was. You know, that story of me actually having John Bonham's kit for a couple of gigs and playing it. And I don't have to, if you're out there as a drummer, I don't have to explain to you what that means. You were... Uh, you know that that's a sign of his greatness. That the feeling that is elicited by just the thought of, of getting anywhere close to that legendary status. But here's a story that probably illustrates his greatness, why he was so great. I can remember I was in every rehearsing and Robert had asked me to come up for it with a beat. You know, sometimes you're just playing along to a tune and you just got to sort of functionally you know, back up the music's going on, but Robert turned around and said, we need a drum beat to kick this off, or we need a drum beat that sort of pulls it all together. So what have you got, Andy? And I started to play some beats. Um, and uh, Robert kept turning around and going, no, no, he goes, that's not quite what I want. I, I wish, he said, I wish I could uh, tell you what I want, but I'm not too sure what I want. And at that moment, I realised that it was for me to come up with something. And that thing wasn't a technical thing, it wasn't based upon what I knew or what I practiced. It was based upon me coming up with something that was an original and was a signature that the music could sit on, a signature sound, but also fitted the music perfectly. And I realized how unbelievably hard that is to do. Um, <laughs> yesterday, I uh, saw a new bit of footage of uh, the Beatles and uh, I didn't have the sound on and I saw them kick off. It was some rare Top of the Pops footage. And, I, and even though the sound was none, I could see, you know, what Ringo was doing. And I knew the tune was Ticket to Ride because I could see him going... And as soon as I saw him go up there, I thought, oh, that's Ticket to Ride. That's a signature. That's a signature drum part that tells you the tune is that tune. Um, now, with Bonham... That is his real genius. It's his ability to do that. But he can do that and also encase those beats, not only with that signature in individuality, but actually with a high level of chops, right? Beats that drummers would hear and go, well, what's going on? How's he doing that? So the first time you hear this is on um, uh, Good Times, Bad Times. So this is the opening track on the first album. Um, now, as a kid, we were, all, we were all really impressed at John Bonham's incredible fast triplet footwork on that track. But right from the outset, we can hear that signature sound. So we get that... And that, that, that opening bit there, the way that John Bonham doesn't just keep time. He keeps time to eighth notes. Da, da, tick, 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 da, da. And then he does that sort of Al Jackson fill, right? That Al Jackson fill he does around the toms points to the fact of who he's listening to, right? So he's pulling in all sorts of influences when you hear this, you know. Um, so we've got this Al Jackson, and then he, he comes into this drum beat. In the days of my together. And that drum beat is following the structure of that song beautifully. Right, but then he's throwing in these signature, incredibly fast tripleted bass drum parts. Okay, that's the power of Bonham, and he does it on the opening track of that tune. Um, 
anybody hearing that would go, who the hell's this guy? My God, this beat's incredible. How is he doing that? That's what creates the legend, okay? Um, later on, I'm thinking of beats like the crunge, all right? So the crunge again, it points to another influence. Now he's listening to obviously James Brown and he's listening to Clyde Stubberfield, Jabo Starks, and all those types of, you know, funky drummers. Like again, a soul influence, right? And he kicks in, but he doesn't sound like Clyde Stubberfield. He sounds like himself, right? And also the crunch is in, you know, an odd time signature. So he's negotiating all that. Here again, we have a beat which is pointing to an outside influence outside of rock music, which is, um, is a signature beat. I could play that beat now and you would go, oh yeah, that's the crunch, I know that tune. And, um, and that requires a whole ton of, you know, chops to play, you know. This is, this is going to make you a legend. Um, but there's more to it with John Wadham because sometimes he'll do signature beats and they're not that hard to play. So when we think of when the levee breaks, right? Most drummers could play when the levee breaks and you would go, oh yeah, I know that tune, that's, that's when the levee breaks. But the thing that gives that beat its signature, as much as the, the brilliance of the simplicity of the construction of the beat by Bonham, it's also the fact that um, it's the drum sound, okay? Now I think this is really, truly what makes um, any musician great is the context within which they're playing. It's more than just what they're playing and what they're doing. It's what they sound like. It's what the other musicians are doing around them. You know, it's how their sound fits in with the sound of the other instruments. Now, when the levee breaks is an almost sublime example of this going on in music. Um, of course, it's very well known. You can check this out on a whole million other videos that that was recorded in a manor house in a stairwell with you know just a couple of drum kits sorry drum mics above the kit it's really a room sound now um, you can go and find out how all that was done and the way they put a little bit of delay on it just to seat it in the mix and all that stuff but what's interesting here is John Bonham had a very open airy way of playing and there's a lot of air in his sound when I listen to his actual drum sound it sounds very much like Buddy Rich, right? If you listen to Buddy Rich's um, drum kit sound, I think Bonham went for that sound. Now, when you take that sound, that very open, organic, warm sound, he's, he's not going for what rock drumming has become, where you just get like the slap of the bass drum and this big crack of the snare drum. His sound is much more warmer you know, and it's actually quite soft in a way because everything is so open, you know, everything is so resonant. But then he comes into contact with Jimmy Page and Jimmy Page has spent the whole of the 60s as a session musician obsessed with, you know, recording and production and picking the brains of all those fantastic engineers and producers that he's worked with throughout the 60s. And one of the, thing that, um, one of the things that Jimmy Page has realised is just to move the mics away and let that air that's there get onto the recording, right? I've often thought that the, uh, the first Led Zeppelin album isn't that innovative. There's other groups at the time doing a very similar blend of, of, of blues and rock, you know, that sound, you know, everyone ex is exploring at that time. One of the things that makes that album so important is the way it's recorded. So if you go and listen to some of the Jeff Beck you know, like Truth or Beckola, those albums. You hear they're doing something very similar to Led Zeppelin, but they haven't got that sound. They haven't got the air in the sound. So Bonham's very lucky that he's got the perfect drum sound. He's, he's not got like a dead sound where he's sticking gaffer tape and, you know, um, towels all over his kit. He's got a very open resonant sound. And Jimmy Page knows how to record that. He knows how to use the air. He knows how to use the acoustics of the room. Okay, and so there's an idea with Led Zeppelin, I think, that the drum sound sort of comes first, all right? Now, this is completely against what we see 
with modern recordings. It's frustrated me very much. Nowadays, someone will, will write the tune in their bedroom. They will demo it all up. They will get everything correct. And then if they want real drums, they've already got a drum kit there. There's BFD or Superior Drum or whatever virtual drum kit they programmed everything on. And that's coloring the whole structure of that song. You know, so they'll call you up and say, you know, do you want to play drums on this? And then you have to go in the studio and drop your drums into something that almost already exists. But with Led Zeppelin, I don't think that's what's happening. I think what's happening is, is that they're putting that, that, that drum kit in the room and they're creating this incredibly big sound. And once they've got that sound right, they are dropping the rest of the track on top of that sound. I'm not saying that's the order even which it was recorded, but I'm saying sonically, that's what's going on. And what you've got in Led Zeppelin is a guitarist that has almost no bass in his sound. So we have that little thin Jimmy Page guitar sound. We have Robert Plant's incredibly high vocal. So the, the other instruments are way out of the way of the drum kit. Often with Zeppelin, you know, John Paul Jones is playing keyboards or bass. You know, when they were putting these tracks down, I, I don't think he can't play both of them. So sometimes the bass would be going down, and and John Paul Jones's bass sound is very economic. It's bassy, it's bassy, but it's economic, and it just sits within um, Bonham's incredible you know, drums. But what we have then psychologically is Led Zeppelin is basically this huge big drum sound in front of you with like this high vocal, this high high guitar, and then um, this sort of, you know, bass just very simplistically wrapping in underneath. So suddenly, this is a band that sound is, is based upon the drums. This is why hip hop, you know, and the Beastie Boys sampled it so much because the drums are a feature all the time. It's what the track is based on. So when you have a drummer who was, let's just recap on this, who has got all these different influences coming in from big band like Buddy Rich, from um, rock and roll, people like Earl Palmer, from soul, people like Al Jackson, Bernard Purdy, uh, Clyde Stubberfield, right? When you put all those influences together, you don't have a rock drummer, you have a drummer that is the summation of all those influences, okay? With technique, you know, John Bonham did have technique, but anyone thinks that that's what makes him great is getting it wrong. There's a million drummers around today that have 150 billion times much more technique than John Bonham's got. In fact, Jason Bonham, if you think of his son, Jason Bon John has now been playing the drums for like 50 years and has studied it. So I, I think that Jason perhaps has more chops an ability in that style that his father invented than, than John Bonham did. But bon Bonham did have chops and that plays a part in his ability to then create signature drum parts and then sit that in a band that was built around those signature drum parts where the, and where the drums were recorded in a way that make those drums sound explosive and new. Right, no one had ever heard those drum sounds before. Right, if you listen to 60s drum, drummer, drumming, that is often, they're tuned almost like bebop, there's a couple of close mics on it, and they're sat in this mix, usually panned over to one of the speakers. Bonham creates this big sound. Now, I, I don't just think he's the only one who does that, because um, my good friend Bev Bevan, who um, I have talked to at length about John Bonham, uh, was also pioneering that sound. So there's a number of drummers that did that. I think later on um, in ELO, Bev, again, with Jeff Lynne with a vision of how to record him, was able to create, you know, a, a, another huge drum sound which was so integral to the tune. But this is another video, and I, I think at some point I would love to get Bev Bevan on here and get him to talk about that as well. But... Um, this really shows you what greatness is and what greatness comes down to, I think, is a mixture of having everything nailed that functionally, you know, giving the song what it needs. That's half of it. But the other half is the individuality of that musician and letting that individuality shine through and not just being the product of one set of influences, but having a wide set of influences that, that you then 
turn into something else. Now, I'm going to do a video uh, to accompany this called, you know, what makes a drummer great. So I could talk about this a little bit more. But I hope that little talk about um, John Bonham was interesting to you. Like I said, I could have gone through his favorite, my favorite drum beats by him and ranked them. But I felt that, you know, I just wanted to bring that sort of little inside information. A lot of the stuff I've um, talked about today has, has actually been informed a little bit by talking to people who played with him. In fact, on Friday, I was chatting to the great Kevin Gammond, one of my best friends and one of the most incredible musicians I know, know who, uh, you know, played with Robert and John Bonham um, in, in the Band of Joy. And I said to him, you know, I said, what, what, what were his influences? And he said, well, I know that John really liked the Beatles, all right? I know that John really liked Ginger Baker. And I said, what about Earl Palmer and all those jazz guys? He goes, yeah, he said he did love those. But I think that started to come in later. To start off with, it was really like big band drummers like Buddy Rich and, and then the, the, the UK big band drummers like Jack Parnell, all those types of guys. But he said the Beatles played a really important role. Now, I've done a video on here where I've talked about the importance of Ringo Starr. That, his ability to create signature drum parts is so important to the development of rock drumming. Um, anyway, so that, this video has really been informed by me going out and having a chat to a, a couple of my mates about, you know, John and where it's come from. So, you know, I hope um, that's been of interest. I am going to come back to John Bonham again, I think, at some point, because he's one of my favourite drummers. It's so lovely to talk about him and keep his memory going. Anyway, thank you for watching this video. You know, if you like, like. If you want to subscribe, please subscribe. And if you really want to support me doing this, you know, become a Patreon and the link's down below. Thank you very much.